So for the first part, we have to identify which marginal tax bracket we're in. Family A is going to be in this marginal tax bracket because their income is between 50 and 100,000. Family B is going to be in this tax bracket, and family C would be in this tax bracket. Simple enough. The second part is to calculate our total tax. This is more complicated. Why? Because we don't just tax the entire $120,000 at 30%. That's not how it works. Instead, for each family, we're going to calculate the first part of their tax, the amount of money that they earn between zero and 20,000 at 5%, and then the money that they earn between 20,000 and 50,000, we're going to tax at 15%. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Maybe, maybe not, we'll see. Okay, so, so for all of the families, they earn more than $20,000, good advice. So for this amount of income, for $20,000, multiplied by 5% is what? $1,000. So each family is going to pay $1,000 for the amount of income that they earned up to $20,000. So all of them are going to pay $1,000. Now, are there families that earn only $20,000, or households, according to the IRS? Of course. Sure there are. So, why do we tax those low-income families at all? Does it make sense for us to tax a family that's only earning $20,000? $1,000? Well, what about some of you? Some of you are your own households now, and some of you might have part-time jobs. And so you're gonna be taxed on your part-time work. Is that, is that a good idea or a bad idea? It's a normative question. Why do you think, though, we have justified taxing folks in low-income brackets? Yes? Would it be because everyone is gonna get taxed the same amount that they are all going to get taxed them at that same amount, but why tax the low-income people at all? How many remember the great motto from the American Revolution? What were they telling Great Britain at the time? They were saying, no taxation without representation. No taxation without representation, right? Well, let's flip it. No representation without taxation. It buys you into the game. It says, I've got skin in the game as well, even though I'm a relatively low income household, I still have skin in the game. I'm a participant in this structure of governance. So I'm a part of the game. Now what we end up doing is remitting a lot of that back to the taxpayer, don't we? We use things like earned income tax credits or, um, aid programs that end up transferring money to people that is often greater than the amount that they pay in taxes. So they, all, they often get the money back. But we also use the tax system a little bit to give them a bit of a break because we tax them less. Now, how many of you know a family that is looking forward to their tax refund after they do their taxes? And we often look forward to that tax refund, right? Because, hey, we're going to get money back from the government that we pay in taxes. And sometimes we're going to get money back that we didn't even pay in taxes. Okay. But there's a problem with that. The problem is, if you had had that money in your pocket all along, instead of with the government, you could have taken it to the bank and invested it and at least gotten a little bit of interest. But when you overpay in taxes such that you get a refund from the government at the end of the year, you have basically made an interest-free loan to the government until the time that you actually get your refund back. You're giving the, money, the government free money. Look, never give a tyrant money. All right? If you give a mouse a cookie, okay. The next step in our calculation here would be that for the amount of money that we earn in this tax bracket, which is 
we're going to pay 15% tax on that $30,000. So we're going to multiply 30,000 times 0.15, and we get out what? 4,500. And all three families are paying that tax as well. Okay, now once we get to the next tax bracket, family A only has total income of $60,000. So they're, they've got $10,000 that is going to be taxed at this rate. Families B and C are gonna be taxed $50,000 at this rate. Are you still with me? So then what's $10,000 taxed at 20%? Two thousand dollars, isn't it? Okay. Now that is the total tax that Family A is going to pay. So altogether, they're going to pay seventy-five hundred dollars. Is that what you got? Not quite. No. Okay. So this is, this is a little bit confusing to figure out at first, isn't it? How this all works. Okay, now family B has, is earning $120,000, so they're gonna pay $20,000 of tax at this rate. And family C is gonna pay $100,000 at this rate. So 20,000 at 30% is $6,000. Now family B is done. So they're paying a total of, I got that right? I missed the 10,000, didn't I? I missed this bracket. I, didn't, I never calculated for them. Let me do that real quick. We know that this part's gonna be 6,000, right? Family B is going to pay a 20% tax on $50,000, which is $10,000. Okay. And Family C is also going to pay that $10,000. Okay, now we're done with Family B. So it looks like they're going to pay $21,500 in taxes. Is that right? So far, and now family C pays 30% on that $100,000. So how much is that? $30,000. We're paying $30,000 in taxes for that money. And then family B C also pays a 35% tax on this last $40,000 that they earn. which I think works out to $14,000. So family C is paying 44, 54, 58, 59, 50. Is that number right? I think that's right. So they're paying $59,500 in taxes. As compared to the $7,500 in taxes that this family is paying, or if we have a family that's only earning $20,000, they're only paying $1,000 in taxes. Now, does family C get 59 votes for every one vote that this family would get? Not in a democracy like ours. In our democracy, the amount that you get to choose about what the government does with the money isn't related to how much money you earn. Instead, it's related to just one person, one vote. Is that good or bad? A normative question, isn't it? All right. In the marketplace, if you've got $59,000 and somebody else has $1,000, 
you basically have 59 more votes than that person does about what to buy. In the marketplace, we allocate resources according to willingness to pay. In higher income, you have more willingness to pay. Notice also, family C pays as much in taxes as family A is earning. Now, there's a lot fewer people in this bracket, aren't right there? Yeah, there's a lot more people in this range than over here. So much so that actually a really, really big chunk of income taxes for the United States is paid by people in the top brackets. What else can we say about all of this? Well, we need to find our rates, don't we? The way we find our average tax is we take the total tax divided by our total income. Have you done that math? Do that real quick. What do we get? Yeah. Seventeen point nine for me. Seventeen point nine percent here. Okay. Anybody have family C? What do you get? Come on, you gotta be engaged. You gotta be involved. Or you're in A. You're in your bed, right? What did you get? I haven't started yet. Okay, come on. <clears throat> For who? C is how much? 1.03? 4? No, that's not right. Yeah, 24.79 should be right. So you should be dividing 59,500 by 240,000. And who has family A? I think, I can't hear you through your mask, I'm sorry. I get 12.5, is that what you said? Okay. Now notice, the higher income family pays a higher percentage of their total income in taxes than the lower income family does. This kind of tax is called a progressive tax. It means that higher income people pay more than lower income people. We could have instead a regressive tax, in which case the lower income people would pay a higher share of their income in taxes than wealthy people. And in many ways, a sales tax is somewhat regressive. Because low income families have to spend whatever income they have on the necessities of life. Whereas higher income families might be able to save some of their money instead. And so a sale, just the direct sales tax ends up in some ways possibly being regressive. How would you fix that? Well, we could put higher sales tax rates on luxury goods, and often we do. Again, these are all normative issues about how we want to structure this thing, right? Okay. Let's do a little more analysis of this real quick. And consider that So this is your income, and this is the tax that you pay. So I want to go 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 20, 40, 60, 80, 200, so 20, 40, okay, you're 60, 120. And then the total amount of tax of tax paid varies um, between up to 60,000. So I gotta make this into 60 somehow. So let me go, um, I don't know what it is. Like five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 50, 50, 50, 50. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 40, 50, 60, $60,000 in taxes. Okay, so if you earn only $20,000, you only pay $1,000 in taxes. If you earn $50,000, 
How much, you, how much total would you pay in taxes? Uh, you would pay 5,500 in taxes. So at $50,000, you'd pay 5,500 in taxes. If you earned $100,000, you would pay about 15,500 in taxes. So at $100,000, you're gonna pay about 15,500 in taxes. If you earn two hundred thousand dollars, you're gonna pay what is it? 30, 40, 45, 50? Right. And if you earn two hundred forty thousand dollars, you end up paying a sixty thousand dollars. What can we say about the slope of each of these lines? It's gradually getting steeper, isn't it? The slope of this line is gradually getting steeper, which illustrates the slope of each of these lines is the marginal tax rate. So as the marginal tax rate goes up, the higher the income you go, the steeper the line gets. Are you still with me? What can we say about the average tax rate? The average tax rate could be described by the line that goes from wherever your income is and the tax that you pay to the origin. So for the, person, the family that earns $120,000, right? The slope of this line of the green line is their average tax rate. It goes all the way from wherever they actually are on this line to the origin. Now, the higher your income gets, the higher your average tax rate gets. So then, the green line was relatively flat at the beginning, and then it starts getting steeper and steeper, but it's never as steep as the marginal rate. Because right? even at this point, when they're earning $240,000, the slope of the average tax rate is 24%, right? But the slope of the marginal tax rate there is 35%. The slope of the black line is steeper than the slope of the green line. Does the geometry help you to picture this a little bit? Maybe a little bit. I'm hoping that it helps a little. How else can we illustrate what's happening with taxes? We drew a supply and demand graph for taxes last week, didn't we? How does that go? Well, it goes like this. It was a dark and stormy night that day at the party, all was quiet. Everyone who came to sell something found someone to buy it. Now imagine that we're putting a tax on beer. What if the tax on beer is a penny? Then, then the supply curve is gonna just only well, it's so small you can't even see it. A really small change in the tax, or in the, in the price of the beer, right? You get a new price that the buyer pays, a new price that the seller gets, right? A change in the quantity of beer a little bit. And then you get this area that is tax revenue and this tiny little area that is dead weight loss. It's a really skinny rectangle inside of this triangle. That really skinny rectangle is the tax revenue. What happens if we increase the size of the tax? What if we charge 60 cents a bottle for, tax, for, for beer? In that case, the price that the buyer pays and the price that the seller gets become more separated from one another. The tax revenue gets a lot bigger, doesn't it? It's that entire rectangle. So the tax revenue increases, and at the same time, the dead weight loss also increases. This whole triangle now is dead weight loss, so the amount of dead weight loss increases also. Can I take the analysis a step further? I always can. What if, what if I raise the tax on beer a lot?
What happens? Well, again, I'm stuck with a very skinny triangle, a rectangle. That really skinny rectangle actually represents, and let's suppose this fly can enter here, and that actually represents a smaller amount of tax revenue than what they would have been able to get with a really big rectangle there. By increasing the rate of the tax too high, they've actually reduced the tax revenue that they collect from the tax, and at the same time, they've massively increased the deadweight losses. Can I show that on a separate graph? Sure, let's do that, right? Okay. So here, how do we want to show this? We want to say size of tax, and then tax revenue. A really small tax gets very small tax revenue. A really, really big tax also gets a really small tax revenue. And if you raise the size of the tax too much, you can actually get back to zero. But somewhere in the middle there, tax revenue will max out. It'll get really high. By finding the right point, you can maximize your tax revenue. What can we say about size tax and the deadweight loss that, it, that, that falls out of that tax? A small tax? Small that we lost. Just a little blue triangle. Bigger tax, bigger dead weight loss. All right, we got this black rectangle. Bigger tax, even bigger dead weight loss. And if we push it too far, the entire market collapses, which is an infinite amount of dead weight loss. This is the harm to us, the people, from raising the tax. This is the harm to the government from raising the tax. Now, suppose we had a dictator in power, and the dictator wanted to maximize their tax revenue, they don't give a damn about you or any other people. Does that mean that the dictator would impose a tax so high that everybody was starving to death? Not if they were a rational dictator, if they're a rational dictator, they're going to charge the peak tax, the tax that gets them the most tax revenue. Why? Because then they can spend it however they want to. Charging more of a tax as a dictator means that they have less money in their own pockets. Unless they just want, like to watch people starve to death, they're not going to do that. So we should never see a government imposing a tax greater than the peak tax, unless the government isn't behaving rationally. Yeah, okay, that sometimes happens. What about the rest of us? We, we don't want the government to charge even that much in tax, do we? Not unless they're gonna charge somebody else the tax and give it to me, in which case, okay, fine. Show me the money. Right, the rest of us are gonna want a tax that's, you know, preferably lower is better for us. Although, perhaps we like some services that are provided by the government and wanna help fund it. Fair. Questions? Now this is also true for income taxes. I showed you this for a tax on beer, but this is also true for income taxes. How? No, that doesn't make sense. How is there going to be less tax if you charge a higher tax rate on income taxes? Suppose, suppose you're a surgeon, right? And you charge $1,000 per surgery. Let's do $10,000 per surgery. Suppose you charge $10,000 per surgery, right? And in order to get $24,000, you need to perform 24 surgeries a year. I don't know whether that's a lot or not enough. I don't know how many surgeries a surgeon performs. Maybe more, maybe less. Maybe. Presuming that a surgeon only earns two hundred forty thousand dollars is a low ball. Maybe they have to pay all their employees as well, and they only get to keep ten thousand dollars of whatever they charge for the actual surgery. Have you ever had a surgery that was really expensive? I did once. I broke my arm in half. I got hurt at work, and my arm got split in half. And they set the bone, but then my nerve got tangled in between the bones. This could be broken bone. You're out. 
And so they actually had to re-break my bone, take the nerves out, put a metal plate and set it. Right? In the meantime, I had radial nerve palsy. The nerves had been pinched, so my nerves weren't working. So my arm was like this for like six months. I would go out to the bar with my buddies and be like, hey, what's up? I drove from Colorado to North Carolina in a car that, missed, that was missing second gear, the stick shift, without the use of my left arm. I need to really get a test. Okay. That was a long time ago. Suppose a surgeon charges $10,000 for surgery. Now, for the first surgery that that surgeon does, I erased some of the interesting information over here. For that first surgery that that surgeon does, they're going to be charged a 5% tax on it. So they're going to have to pay, what is it? $500 in taxes on it, right? And they get to keep the other $9,500. The second surgery they perform, they get to keep $9,500 and pay $500 in taxes. The next surgery that they perform, they're going to be charged 15% taxes on it, right? They get to keep $8,500 of it and pay $1,500 in taxes. But that last surgery that they perform, they're being charged $3,500. Hundred dollars in taxes for doing that last surgery. Now, here's what I want to ask you. Suppose you're working a regular job, 40 hours a week. Now, you're working your 40 hours, and it's the end of your shift on the last day of the week, and your boss comes to you and says, I know you worked all week, but we could really use you for a few more hours. Here's the idea. You work a few more hours, and I'll pay you less. How many of you are going to stay late for less money? How many of you want to earn less money for the last hour that you worked than what you earned for the first hour that you worked? What are you going to tell your boss? Oh, sorry, my mom just called. I got to go. Right? So for the surgeon, however, we're basically telling him for the last surgery that you do, we're going to let you keep less of the money than the money that you earned for the first surgery that you did. Is that what you want to say to the surgeon? What does that $10,000 that the surgeon collects represent? What does it really mean? In every voluntary transaction, the seller has a minimum willingness to sell point, and the buyer has a maximum willingness to pay point, right? The fact that $10,000 is somewhere in the middle there indicates that you're getting more out of it than the $10,000 that you have to pay to get it. In other words, the $10,000 that you pay for the surgery is worth it to you. It's value created by the surgeon that you then get to enjoy. What if, what if the surgeon's willingness to sell point, right, is seven thousand dollars? He's not willing to do the surgery for anything less than seven thousand dollars in take-home pay, after paying taxes. Once you bump up the tax rate to thirty-five percent on that last surgery, what happens? He doesn't do the surgery. He doesn't do the surgery. He doesn't earn the money. The government doesn't collect the tax revenue that it was hoping to collect from him. And what else happens? Someone's not having a good time. I'm still walking around like this. Right? You don't get the surgery. The high income that some people earn, supposing that they earn it honestly, an important caveat, represents value that they're creating for the rest of us. We don't want to penalize people for creating value for us, do we? Well, maybe we do, it could be a normative question, but that's the opportunity cost. You decide whether it's worth it to you. Are you with me? Okay. So then, high marginal tax rates can discourage work. What can we do instead of having a progressive tax. Why do we have a progressive tax? What are the goals, what are the stated ends of having a progressive tax? Why, why a progressive tax instead of a regressive tax? We want to help low-income folks, don't we? 
We want them to have enough money to live off of. Okay, maybe that's fair. Now, the tax system is a mechanism for collecting revenues. There are other programs that the government runs, like Social Security, like welfare, food stamps, subsidized housing, Medicaid, Medicare, lots of other programs that the government runs that are expenditures that help low-income folks, disproportionately to higher-income folks. Are you with me? Okay. So we have programs that are expenditures, and then we have this tax system that is a revenue, but the progressive tax essentially functions to make some of the expenditure part of what the government does the responsibility of the IRS that is responsible for revenues. Could we do it a different way? Could we separate the expenditures from the revenues? Sure, half. Charge a 15% flat tax. What would that mean? That means no matter what your income is, you're gonna pay 15% in taxes. Could that work? Well, those low income families would have to be paying 15% on their taxes. Do we want them to have to do that? No, but instead of using the tax system to give them a break, we could just give them enough money to live off of. Right? We could use expenditure programs to help care for them instead of the revenue program to help care for them so that they're just as well off as they were trying to handle this through the revenue side. So we can use those other programs that exist and increase this, the, the payout that they receive from those programs, thus separating the revenue from the expenditure side. Actually, there's a, uh, one kind of a program for expenditures that's really simple. It's called the Basic Income Guarantee. And the idea behind the Basic Income Guarantee is everybody gets $1,000. You get a thousand dollars. You get a thousand dollars. Oprah gets a thousand dollars, right? Everybody gets a thousand dollars, no matter what your income is, or whatever amount we decide is the amount necessary for people to live off of. And instead of having all of those other programs be used to to help those low income folks get by, we just give them enough money that they can get by, and we close down all of those other programs. Why might we not like that idea? What is the number one reason people might not like that idea? Do you have an idea? Uh, from what I understand, uh, if you close down all those sports, you might be closing down sports that other people in other tax brackets. Maybe. Well, I'm not talking about stores. I'm talking about like social security, welfare, oh, yeah. uh, subsidized housing. Shut down all those programs and just give them the same amount of money that they were, would have received through those programs. Why might we not like that? What's the number one complaint? Yeah. Well, they'll have the money and they could do, they won't be better off. Would they be any worse off? Technically, no. What else might be a complaint? Uh, all that goes towards like our social security as well. Um, we're going to make, make everybody just as well off as they were, but we're going to give these people money instead of programs. Yeah? Do you mean the fact that you will still have more than those programs? Well, they'll still have the money that the programs would have given them. I think the number one complaint that people have is, well, how are they going to spend the money? Are they going to spend that money the same way that they would have if they were getting money through the programs? Maybe not, right? Oh, they're going to go spend that money in drugs and alcohol. Right? That's often the complaint. Now, that might be a legitimate complaint, but it does mean that we're treating government as our daddy. It's a paternalistic approach to governance, isn't it? It's saying we don't trust those people to spend the money wisely. Hmm. Who else might not like this program? How about... All the people that work in welfare, 
and subsidized, subsidized housing and all those programs. They might not like it because now what? They don't have a job. They can go find another job, okay? Because the job that they're doing isn't really creating value compared to just giving those people cash. It's easier to give to create that value just by giving those people money, right? Who might be against using a flat tax? Sorry? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Low income people. Low income people, but if they're made well by this, revenue neutral, they won't worry. Who else might not like a flat tax? How about everybody that works for the IRS? Because now instead of having a really complicated tax form to fill out every year, it's just 15%. No deductions, no exclusions, no loopholes. Everybody pays the 15% tax. In other words, the tax form is this. I made this much, here's my 15% of that. Done. Instead of 20 pages. So who else is made worse off? How many of you are accounting majors? Right? No more jobs for accountants. Right? Accountants are out the door. Why? Because most of the work that accountants do has to do with finding loopholes in the taxes. Finding the loopholes in the taxes. That reminds me of something, right? This family over here is paying 24% in taxes or paying $59,000 in taxes. Are they really paying $59,000 in taxes? Or maybe is this family paying something closer to $750 in taxes? I don't know of anybody wealthy who only paid $750 in taxes in 2016. Do you know of anybody who might have done that? I don't know if they're hurting since $7,000 repair, so I can't complain. How can they do that? They hired you, right? They hired an accountant to find all the loopholes. But the flat tax says no loopholes, buddy. Mortgage, into, mortgage interest rate deduction, no, gone, out the door. No deductions. Everybody pays that 15%. No loopholes. A lot of unemployed accountants, they can do something else. They can go make something useful in the world. Instead, all they're doing is trying to play with numbers. I mean, it's creating value for the people that they serve, but in terms of actually creating something in the world, not so much. Are you with me? I love accountants. I hire my accountant every year to do my taxes. So this was the plan proposed by Ben Carson in 2016 during the presidential election that I worked on. I worked on his campaign and we were talking about using a flat tax. And we're trying to figure out, well, how can we make people revenue neutral? And these were the ideas that we had in mind. Is this the best plan? I don't know. I'm not saying this is the right thing to do. I'm saying here's an alternative that could work. Here's the opportunity costs. And because it would unemploy everybody in the IRS, because it would unemploy everybody in those social welfare programs, and because it would unemploy all those accountants, that's enough people who vote that probably this won't happen. For the same reason that there's enough people who work in healthcare insurance, that having a single payer health care plan probably won't happen. I'm not saying it should or it shouldn't. I'm saying that politically, there are these barriers that are involved in arriving at those kinds of decisions. Are you with me? Okay. Now, I don't think that I've made any strongly normative statements so far today. I pointed out a lot of opportunity costs. I don't think I've made very strong, maybe that $750 was normative. You decide, okay? On Friday, I'm gonna be a part of a debate with Senator Mike, uh, Mike Braun and con one of the congressmen from Ohio. I can't remember his name right now, right? I'm gonna be representing the libertarian point of view, <laughs> all right, in this debate. And they're gonna be representing Trump and Biden. Okay, this should be interesting. Now. We have the ideological terrain test coming up, don't we? Haven't assigned it yet, but it's out there somewhere. I'm giving you enough time to finish reading that claim book that you can do well on the quiz. Here's what you can practice, okay? You can watch that debate. And you can listen to hear whether I fall into using the libertarian tribal language, or maybe when I'm responding to the conservative, I can use the conservative tribal language to communicate the libertarian policy prescriptions. Then I would be talking with that person instead of past them. Are you with me? 
And then when I'm talking to the Democrat representative, if I use the progressive tribal language in communicating with that person and yet still maintaining my own policy preferences, then I'm gonna be talking with that person and not past them. If you wanna watch, I'll send a link, okay? It should be interesting, I've never done this before. I'm not a polished guy. And I'm not like, hey, look at, you know, I don't have a great smile. You can't tell, you've never seen me smile. But I'm a little apprehensive, but I'm also a little bit excited. There are two assignments on Canvas that I haven't mentioned. One is the balance of the budget assignment. That balance of the budget assignment, what you have to do is go in and adjust all of the different expenditures and payout programs that the government has involved. Why do you think I'm gonna give that assignment to you? The goal, the pedagogical purpose of that assignment is for you to get a feel for where the government's money is actually going. Does that make sense? To understand this part of the federal budget is large, this part of the federal budget is small, to get a feel for that. What I want you to do for that assignment is I want you to print out the entire thing so that I can see all of the changes that you've made in the budget, not the summary at the end, and post that as a PDF to Canvas. And I want to see the whole thing, because I'm curious, but I also want to see that you interacted with the whole thing. And sort of pay attention to, is this a lot of money or is this not a lot of money? That's going to foreign aid, for example. The next assignment that's also in Canvas is, um, does your vote matter, or something like that. Now for this assignment, what I've asked you to do is, to find a sample ballot for wherever it is that you happen to be living, whatever, wherever your um, voting district is, whether that's in Illinois or Muncie, wherever it is, right? And I want you to find all of the different elections that are gonna be on that ballot. Because it's not just the presidential election, is it? There's a lot of different things that are being voted for. Now, I want you to suppose that, bear with me, okay? I got a little excited about this stuff. I want you to suppose that for every person that you would vote for, if that person, if, the, if your person, the person that you prefer won, you would get $100. $100 in cash, $100 in terms of programs that you want, $100 just in personal preferences, whatever. But then I want you to multiply that $100 by one, divided by the population of people who are involved in that election. So for the presidential election, it's the entire population of the United States. For the position, that's one divided by whatever the population of the county is. Now, it's less than that because not everybody votes, right? But we're just gonna use the population as a proxy. So here's the deal. We're going to suppose that it costs you a dollar to vote. Why would it cost you a dollar to vote? It might just cost you a dollar of your time to stand in line to vote, or a dollar in postage, or a dollar of your time to fill out the ballot. It would cost more than that if you actually spent time to research who was running for each of these positions and what their policy positions were, wouldn't it? It's a lot of opportunity cost of time. Have you guys researched the candidates that are running for office? Do you know who the congressional representative to the United States government is in the House from your district? Can you name all seven of the Supreme Court justices? Trick question, there's nine. Well, right now there's eight. Okay. How long is a senator's term in government? Six years. A congressman's term is two. There's a lot that we're ignorant about when it comes to government. But we're rationally ignorant. There's a lot that we don't know about politics because it doesn't really affect our lives very much. So we're rationally ignorant about it. So then, we're gonna assume that you're spending $1 to vote and the probability of your vote mattering is the population of the United States. I'm sorry, it costs you a dollar to vote, right? And this is the probability that your preferred candidate wins so you're going to multiply that amount by 100 and then compare it to the dollar that it costs you to vote. Which side is greater? 
In this case, it would definitely be the dollar that it costs you to vote. And the cost is greater than the potential benefit. So, should you vote? It's up to you. You might get an additional benefit from voting besides your preferred candidate winning, but I want you to do this for every election that on whatever ballot you're you could participate in wherever it is that you happen to live. Or wherever it is you're living right now. And you can, I posted links to that on there. Okay, um, that's enough for today. Thank you for bearing with me a few extra minutes.